Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us for our special Brave Girls virtual story time uh, on The Flying Girl, How Aide de Acosta Learned to Soar with author Margarita Engel. Uh, this program today is part of the National Women's History Museum's Hispanic Heritage Month and is presented in partnership with Telemundo's Unstoppable Woman Initiative. My name is Emma Rothberg, and I'm the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation at the National Women's History Museum. A few housekeeping notes. We are recording this presentation so that it can be available on our YouTube page, page following the event. Margarita will be answering questions at the end of her reading, and you are welcome to ask your questions at any time during the program by using the Q&A feature, which is on the toolbar of your Zoom. Uh, you may ask your questions at any time during the presentation, but they won't be answered until the end. Uh, and Margarita is happy to answer questions in both English and Spanish. And with that, I would love to introduce our author. Margarita, Margarita Engel is the Cuban-American author of many verse novels, memoirs, and picture books, including The Surrender Tree, Enchanted Air, Drum Dream Girl, and Dancing Hands. Her awards include a Newbery Honor, the Pura Belpre, Golden Kite, Walter, Jane Addams, Penn, USA, and the NSK Newtstat, among others. Margarita served as the National 2017 to 2019 Young People's Poet Laureate, and she is a three-time U.S. nominee for the Astrid Lindring Book Award. Her most recent books are Your Heart, My Sky, A Song of Fruitus, Light for All, Rima's Rebellion, and Singing with Elephants. Her next young adult verse novel is Wings in the Wild, and her next picture book is Water Day. Margarita was born in Los Angeles, but developed a deep attachment to her mother's homeland during childhood summers with relatives on the island. She studied agronomy and botany along with creative writing and now lives in Central California with her husband. So we are thrilled that Margarita is able to be here with us today and to read her book. And please welcome Margarita to the screen. Thank you so much. It's such an exciting privilege to um, be able to speak about both science and poetry at the same time, because as was just mentioned in the introduction, I am a scientist, botanist, agronomist, but I'm also a poet. And I wrote The Flying Girl out of admiration for the courage and perseverance of Aida de Acosta, who, when she was only a teenager, 19, flew a motorized flying machine, a dirigible, before the Wright brothers. And yet she has been left out of all the history books about aviation, including history books about women in aviation. It's an unusual story. She was Cuban American, grew up in New Jersey, but she was on vacation with her mother in Paris. She was from a well-off family. And it was what they used to call the grand tour back then where people who could afford it would go and, and see many different parts of the world. In Paris, she happened to see a man fly by in a dirigible, which at the time, you know, this was well over a hundred years ago at the time, it was so unusual. It, it was unheard of. It had hardly ever been done. This, this man who invented the motorized dirigibles was from Brazil and he had uh, flown a few times, but it was still completely new. There were no fixed wing airplanes yet. When she saw him, she thought, if he can do that, so can I. And that was such an unusual thing to think at the time, because girls were constantly being told by their parents and their teachers and everyone else that only boys could do certain things. And certainly operating machinery was one of them, especially large machinery. So I admire her courage for actually going to him and asking him to teach her. Now, don't forget, her mother was with her, and her mother had to agree for her to take these flying lessons. And her mother did agree. 
on the condition that she keep it secret afterwards and not let her father know. Now, how strange is this? It's because her father believed what most adults thought at the time, that women should never be in the newspaper, that it was they, they were only in the newspaper if they'd done something bad. So they didn't want any publicity to show that she had done something so unusual. They thought nobody would marry her if she did something that would get her in the newspaper. And at the time, getting married was the only thing that was uh, considered acceptable for a young lady. So I admire not only her courage to speak up and say, I wanna learn how to fly this machine, but her perseverance to actually learn. She did get the lessons. He was the inventor, was a very unusual man. And I'm going to read the flying girl to show you some of the unusual things that he did. And her courage and perseverance in learning how to fly this machine and being the first. One day, a girl named Aida was strolling on a lively street in a lovely city when she glanced up and was dazzled by the sight of a huge balloon that glided as gracefully as a whale-shaped moon. Below the balloon, an airboat dangled, and inside there was a man. If that man can fly, so can I, cried Aida. All I need are some lessons and a chance to try. Aida's mother scolded, no, 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 silly girl, don't be so bold, ay, 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 no one will ever marry a girl who dares to fly. But Aida had a dream now, a wild dream of soaring, and she did not care to marry anyone who thought dreams were boring. So Aida asked the man to teach her the art of airship flight. The inventor of airships, whose name was Alberto, agreed to show Aida how to start a motor and steer, turn left, turn right. Lessons on the ground weren't easy, but Aida worked hard and soon learned how to pull this lever, tug that rope, drop more ballast, believe, practice, hope. One evening, Alberto invited Aida to an aerial dinner with tables as tall as elephants served by waiters who walked on tilted stilts that made them look like silly giraffes. At dinner, Alberto said that his airships were meant to be chariots of peace so that people all over the world could meet one another and develop friendships by flying back and forth. What an unusual dinner at those tall tables. When Alberto invited Aida to ride while he drove an airship, she cried, no, 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 ay, 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 I don't want to be a passenger. I only want to be the pilot. Alberto was amazed. Aida was just a teenager and no woman or girl had ever flown before, but no one had believed Alberto's wild dream of motorized flight could come true either. Not so Alberto realized that if he could fly, Aida could too. All she needed was courage and a chance to try. On a clear summer day, Aida finally had her thrilling chance to pull this lever, tug that rope, drop more ballast, believe, rise up, hope. Like a whale-shaped moon, the airship's enormous balloon soared above the busy city and out to the countryside. It sailed over green farms and cows and sheep, high above the heads of excited children who cried out, look, look, it's a girl and she's flying. From her dangling airboat, Aida smiled down at the children. But then she frowned at Alberto, who was on a road far below, frantically pedaling his bicycle and waving a handkerchief 
as he tried to show her which way to go, even though she had already told him that she did not need help because she had practiced. Alberto got tangled in a thicket of trees and fell far behind. Aida kept flying high above roads and rivers, completely alone, truly free, until finally she reached her destination, a green field where swift polo ponies twirled and leaped like dancers. Aida landed skillfully, planning to watch the daring game, but down on the ground, she soon found that she could not climb out of the airboat. Her dress was too fancy, the skirt was too tight, so she wiggled while children giggled until in the end, some helpful men had to tip the boat sideways so that she could slide out almost gracefully without too much of a bumpy toppling tumble. Aida tried to watch the horses, but angry strangers surrounded her, shouting, scolding, calling names, saying she was too bold, too brave, too different, too strange. Girls, they hollered, should only be allowed to learn how to cook, sew, and clean. But girls, they bellowed, should never be taught how to fly huge machines. Just then, Alberto finally caught up, still pedaling his bicycle, eager to cheer her. You did it, he shouted. You flew. You're a hero. Such a brave inspiration for all the girls of the world. Aida smiled. Aida laughed. Yes, yes, yes. Ay, ay, ay. She really was the first, but she was sure she would not last. Every child who had seen her glide so high above roads and fields was probably already singing. If that young lady can fly, so can I. All I need are some lessons and a chance. Sometimes, Aida said to Alberto, all it takes to change the whole world is one wild dreamer's soaring example. So if there's something that you really want to do, don't listen when people say, no, it's impossible, because you could be like Aida and learn. And I'm going to repeat the whole story now uh, in Spanish. La joven aviadora. Y ilustraciones de Sara Palacios, traducción de Teresa Laura. Un día. Una joven llamada Aida paseaba por una animada calle en una ciudad encantadora, cuando miró al cielo y se quedó maravillada ante la vista de un inmenso globo que se movía con la elegancia de una luna en forma de ballena. Una góndola colgaba del globo y dentro había un hombre. Si ese hombre puede volar, yo también puedo, exclamó Aida. Todo lo que necesito son algunas clases y una oportunidad. La mamá de Aida le dijo, ay, no, 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 niña, no seas tan atrevida. ¿Quién se va a casar con una joven que quiere volar? Pero ahora Aida tenía un sueño, el increíble sueño de elevarse a las alturas y no le interesaba casarse con alguien que pensara que los sueños eran algo descabellado y tonto. Y Aida le pidió al hombre que le enseñara el arte de volar un dirigible. El inventor del dirigible, que se llama Alberto, estuvo de acuerdo en enseñarle a Aida cómo poner en marcha el motor y dirigir la nave hacia la izquierda, hacia la derecha. Las clases en tierra no fueron fáciles. 
pero Aida trabajó duro y aprendió con rapidez a accionar esta palanca, alar aquel cabo, soltar más lastre, a creer, practicar, confiar. Una tarde, Alberto invitó a Aida a una cena aérea con mesas tan altas como elefantes, atendidas por camareros que se desplazaban sobre larguísimos zancos que los hacían parecer absurdas jirafas. Durante la cena, Alberto comentó que sus dirigibles eran como carrozas de la paz, en las que personas de todo el mundo podían encontrarse y hacer nuevas amistades volando de un lugar a otro. Cuando Alberto invitó a Aida a dar un paseo en su dirigible, ella le dijo, no, 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 no quiero ser una pasajera, quiero ser el piloto. Alberto estaba sorprendido. Aida no era más que un uh, adolescente y ninguna mujer o joven había volado antes, pero tampoco nadie había creído que su increíble sueño de hacer un vuelo a motor pudiera convertirse en realidad, no hasta que él inventó su dirigible. Y Alberto se dio cuenta de que si él podía volar, Aida también podía hacerlo. Todo lo que ella necesitaba era coraje y una oportunidad. En un despejado día de verano, Aida por fin tuvo esa emocionante oportunidad de accionar esta palanca al dar aquel cabo, soltar más lastre, de creer, de elevarse, de soñar. Como una luna en forma de ballena, el enorme globo dirigible se elevó sobre la ajetreada ciudad y llegó hasta la campiña, sobrevoló verdes granjas, vacas y ovejas por sobre las cabezas de niños que gritaban entusiasmados, miren, miren, es una chica y está volando. Desde su góndola, Aida sonreía a los niños, pero también fruncía el ceño al ver que Alberto la seguía por tierra, pedaleando frenéticamente, agitando un pañuelo para indicarle el camino a seguir. De que ella le había dicho que no necesitaba ayuda, pues había practicado. El sombrero de Alberto se enganchó en una rama y se quedó rezagado. Aida continuó volando sobre campos y ríos, completamente sola, realmente libre, hasta que por fin llegó a su destino, un verde campo de polo donde ágiles ponis hacían piruetas y saltaban como bailarines. Aida aterrizó con destreza esperando poder ver el osado juego, pero ya en tierra comprobó que no podía bajarse de la góndola. Su vestido era demasiado elegante, la falda demasiado ajustada, se movía de un lado a otro tratando de bajarse mientras los niños se reían, hasta que unos amables señores inclinaron la góndola hacia un lado para que ella pudiera deslizarse con cierta gracia, sin tropiezos ni caídas. Aida quería ver el juego, pero se vio rodeada de extraños que le gritaban, la insultaban y le decían que era muy atrevida, demasiado valiente, alguien diferente, extraña. 
Gritaban que las niñas solo debían aprender a cocinar, coser y limpiar y nunca aprender a volar enormes máquinas. Justo en ese momento apareció Alberto pedaleando en su bicicleta, deseoso de felicitarla. Lo lograste, gritó, volaste, eres una heroína, un ejemplo de valor e inspiración para todas las niñas del mundo. Aida se sonrió, Aida se sonrió. Sí, 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 de veras había sido la primera, pero estaba segura de que no sería la última. Cada niño y ni niña que la, la había visto elevarse sobre ciudades y campos, ahora cantaría. Si esa joven puede volar, yo también puedo. Lo único que necesito son clases y una oportunidad. A veces, Aida le dijo a Alberto, todo lo que se necesita para cambiar el mundo es el impetuoso afán de un intrépido soñador. Muchas gracias. I'd like to just say that one of the uh, things that fascinated me most about this story was not only Aida's flight, which was historic and deserves to be recognized, even though it was kept secret by her parents at the time, but I also admire peacemakers of all sorts. And the original invention of this motorized aircraft by Alberto and her flight were intended as peacemaking gestures. It was thought that aircraft would be used for traveling to visit each other and getting to know each other better, not for war. And that's one thing I really admire about their vision, both of them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Margarita, for sharing your wonderful story with us in both Spanish and English. Um, I was really enjoying just listening um, and hearing the lyricism of your work. And uh, just I'm so thankful that you could share um, Aida's story and you know help her come back to life and, and out of the archive. So, Thank you. Yeah, so I guess related to that, because Aida de Acosta's story is, is not well known, how did you find out about her story? What was that moment like? I found out about it just in passing while reading about him, the inventor, uh, and about the motorized dirigibles, which had been invented and flown before the Wright brothers. And I'm always fascinated by aspects of history that are basically forgotten. Now he is not forgotten in Brazil. He's very important in Brazil, but she has been forgotten. In this case, partly because she was forced to keep it secret. She promised her parents. Um, there was one newspaper article in Paris right after it happened. And she promised she would never meet it, uh, show that to anybody. She would never talk about it. And she would never uh, mention it in public. Not only did she not mention it in public, she didn't even tell her husband until decades later. And he happened to be uh, a friend of famous aviators. And when they were telling her all about what it felt like to fly, she finally, when she was an old woman said, oh yeah, I know I did that. <laughs> so uh, at that point, after her parents passed, she kept her promise to her parents. After they passed, she donated all her papers and a memorabilia to the Smithsonian. And so her story became available for research purposes. Uh, and yet, of course, it's much more obscure than doing research on somebody who was famous all along, 
like the Wright brothers. But it always fascinates me that the people who have been, and it saddens me, the people who have been left out of history are generally women and people of color. And so um, both she and Alberto Santos Dumont, the inventor of the dirigible, are not as well known in, in the United States as they should be. Now she was Cuban, but she was Cuban American. She was from New Jersey and she should be known and uh, honored for what she did. Um, I would love for this book to help bring both of them back into history in any way. When I do research for a project like this, one of the most difficult things is deciding what to leave out. Um, because I want it to be a poem that's fun to read and that flows and that isn't all clogged up with lots of unnecessary details. Um, so I want it to read in a musical way and be fun, almost, uh, almost a song, not quite a song, but almost. Yeah, so I guess related to the, the, the song and reading it like a song, um, how, because it was, it was very poetic and, and musical, your story. So, I mean, how has music and poetry influenced your life and your writing? I've been writing poetry since I was very young. Uh, my mother recited a lot of Spanish poetry to me when I was little. She didn't know English yet. She's from Cuba, but I was born and raised in the US. Uh, she had uh, met my father when he was, visited Cuba and they didn't speak the same language, but they fell in love at first sight and got married. They were artists, so they passed pictures back and forth to get to know each other. Then she would read poetry to me and uh, I loved the rhythm not just the rhyme, it was very musical. It, I find it um, emotional in a way that uh, makes me happy. <laughs> Even if the story were sad, I could feel happy at the end of a musical comforting poem. So all my life I've been reading and writing po poetry and I think it's a mistake when teachers ask children what a poem means. I would hope that they would ask instead, how does the poem make you feel? Because like music, it appeals to our emotions. And it may not, we may not always be able to understand exactly what the poet meant, but they came from the poet's emotions and it means something different to each of us, depending on our background, our experiences. So I think that um, in order to enjoy poetry, just as we enjoy music, we need to just relax and enjoy it. And it's the same for writing poetry as for reading or listening to it. Uh, it should be an act of uh, relaxation and pleasure. That's a, that's a wonderful message, the idea that a poetry, that poetry and writing a poem, listening to a poem is not only something that everyone can do and they can do it in a way that is meaningful to them. And I, you know, I remember as a little kid, I thought all poems needed to rhyme and I found that so stifling, but you know, the idea that any, you know, it, a poem is how you feel about it. That's, I mean, that's a wonderful sentiment. Uh, so thank you for sharing. And thank I apologize, you. Apologize, something just fell <laughs> off my wall. Um, but we have uh, another question that has come in, and someone wants to know that: Do you think Aida was scared to fly? Um, she knew that it was going to be difficult. Now, when she did finally start talking to people and doing interviews, when she was older. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of, of written um, sources of her feelings. And when I write about somebody, I want to know how they felt about what they did. I don't want to guess at that. So 
what I really noticed and what she said about what she did was her courage and determination. She may have felt scared, but that's not what she focused on when she talked about it many years later. She focused on that, first of all, the courage to speak up. The, you know, the moment could have passed. She had to tell her mother, take me to see that man. I want him to teach me how to fly. And I mean, her mother would have just thought that was a, not a possibility. And then it, he thought it was not a possibility. And she insisted. I was very impressed with her quote. I don't want to be a passenger. I want to be the pilot. She had to speak very directly and boldly in order to get lessons. <laughs> and that was just the beginning. I mean, that, that line is also stands out to me because I, you know, so many times I think we, you know, we as human beings think that we shouldn't speak up for ourselves and, and that Aida de Acosta is, is such a wonderful example of standing up for yourself and being courageous is, um, I just think one of the main takeaways for me from your story. So, uh, so thank you for, again, for sharing and, and for answering about the, 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 the fear. I mean, it's okay to be scared sometimes, but as long as you kind of push through, you know, like Aida did, I think that's a, you know, again, it's a wonderful message. It um, is. And I, and I will admit to being terrified myself um, when I took one flying lesson in a small aircraft, not for this book, for a previous one, um, I was very scared. <laughs> I still get scared on planes too sometimes. I mean, you know. Well, it's, it's like weird. driving a car, except you have to worry about up and down it not just left and right, <laughs> but you have to know what's in front of you, behind you, above you, below you, and left and right. So those small airplanes don't have, you know, radar and all that kind of uh, sophisticated um, navigation. And certainly her aircraft did not. Absolutely. So um, one more question. So for those of us who want to learn more about Aida de Acosta, um, what suggestions do you have? Where should we start? Well, um, there is a, a, I did, I believe, mention in the back that there is a book about Alberto Santos Dumont, and that's a good resource. But I don't know of any other books about her. I don't know of a book about her uh, for adults. And there should be. And hopefully, as people become more interested in women's history, which your museum is so exciting. Uh, but right now, as far as I know, everything is still at the Smithsonian, the Hispanic division of um, the Library of Congress is very helpful in helping people to find reference materials. You also have a, a biography that's in the back of the of the book, correct? Well, I have a short author's note that includes the sources that are known that I know of. That's so wonderful. So this is not only um, can people learn more about Aida just by reading the book and looking at the wonderful illustrations, but that there's more to learn uh, on that back page. Um, and librarians will help. That's always the best starting point. <laughs> librarians are a wonderful resource. Well, I just wanna say thank you again so much, Margarita, for being with us today and sharing the powerful, inspiring story of Aida de Acosta. And for more, please visit Margarita's website, margarita, margaritaangle.com or the publisher's page, Simon & Schuster, where you'll find resource guides for teachers in both English and Spanish. And if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on Wednesday, October 12th for another Brave Girls Virtual Storytime where we will be joined by author Joanne Robertson for a reading of her book, The Water Walker, in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. This event is free, but advanced registration is required, and more details and registration information can be found on womenshistory.org 
So again, Margarita, thank you so much for being with us today and for reading your wonderful lyrical book in both English and Spanish. It was a pleasure. Um, and I hope that everyone stays healthy and safe and enjoys the rest of their Wednesday. Thank, Thank you. you. Muchas gracias. Bye.